Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to today's Strategy and Resources Screening Board. I'm Councillor Andrew Scopes and I'm the Chair of this meeting. Today we've got a packed agenda. This is the last uh, meeting in this municipal year. So um, hopefully, we're not hopefully, we'll definitely also talk about the work we've done this year and also just talk about anything we want to pass on to the um, successor board towards the end of this meeting. Okay, so let's um, start with some introductions, if that's okay. So as I said, I'm Andrew Scopes, I'm the councillor for Beeson Holbeck and I'm chair of this meeting. We'll go around the room this way, please. Thank you. Becky Atherton, Principal Scrutiny Advisor, and I'm also clerking today. Good morning, Councillor Caroline Gruen. I represent Bramley and Stanningley. I'm Councillor Sharon Burke. I represent Middleton Park. Good morning, Councillor Gower Almas from Beeson Holbeck Ward. Good morning, Councillor Peter Carlyle, Cavalin Fasley Ward. Good morning, Councillor Kevin Ritchie, Bramley and Stanley Ward. Good morning, Claire Matson, Head of HR. Good morning, I'm Andy Dobman, I'm the Chief HR Officer. Uh, good morning, I'm John Yebo, Head of HR for um, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. Mariana Paxton, Incoming Director of Resources, nearly. <laughs> Morning, Councillor Deborah Cooper. I'm the Exec Board Member for Resources. Good morning, Councillor Diane Chapman for Rockwell Ward. Uh, morning, Billy Flynn, Councillor for Adam Wharfdale Ward. Uh, morning, everyone. Rob Clayton, Principal Screening Advisor. Thank you very much, everyone, and welcome. OK, I'm going to just pass over to Becky for the first few formal items of the agenda. Thank you. Morning. Item one, appeals. There are no appeals against the refusal of inspection documents. Item two, there are no items excluded from the public domain. Item three, there are no late items. Item four, declarations of interest. Can I ask members to disclose any interest in accordance with Leeds City Council's Code of Conduct? I will take silence as none. And, um, and finally, item five, apologies. We've had apologies from Councillor Sam Firth um, with no substitute attending. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move on to the minutes of last meeting. Firstly, I'll take any matters of accuracy. Does anyone want to raise any matters of accuracy? No, okay, so we'll take those as read. Uh, Rob, can you run through the matters rising and then I'll open to questions again. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, so as uh, board members may recall, we considered some confidential information at the last meeting relating to uh, procurement and commercial services. Just to inform board members that um, the chair and, and myself are exploring um, how that may or may not be minuted moving forward. So that could be subject to some adjustment in the future. So just, just to note that for board members' information. And then uh, matters arising, uh, minute 91, this relates to the peer challenge item we considered in February. So board members should be aware that a letter was sent uh, by council scopes to the leader and the executive board just to cover off the discussion that was held and the input from this board and the scrutiny chairs that attended that meeting and um, that has also been shared with um the scrutiny chairs themselves the four other ones uh, minute 92 relates to additional information um linked to the civic enterprise leads items that concentrate on cheapy of staff um, and information on service budgets Minute 93, similarly, uh, procurement information was circulated to board members last week. Um, again, uh, following board member requests. Um, and then lastly, uh, members will have noted that the EDI working group that was referred to has now actually moved on to today's agenda. So that is now no longer a, uh, something that we're looking to organise. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you very much. Anything else from members of the board? No? Okay. So we're going to move on to the first substantive item of the meeting. This is um, uh, Andy Dodman. I think you're leading this. You can assume everyone's read the papers, but if you want to say a few introductory remarks, that's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, yes, good morning, everybody. So I'm Andy Dodman from the HR team. So I'll introduce this paper briefly, which is item seven. Um, 
As you know from the paper, it provides an update on the work the Council has been doing regarding the management of absence and attendance. Um, as the Board knows, we have a very well-established formal process and procedures and guidance for the management of attendance, which we've had in place for quite some time. However, over um, the last few months since summer of last year, we did set out six targeted additional interventions um, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and those six interventions are set out in your paper. Um, and they do cover a whole range of different initiatives, which I won't take you through in detail, um, but just to tease out, they include um, the more robust reporting and analysis of uh, absence management. Um, they also reference our pivoting and prioritization uh, of absence management in some very specific services. You can see as well from the paper that we've had a particular focus on managing long-term sickness and also specifically the reasons for ill health across the council. And also there's a piece there about building managerial capability and that uh, long-term well-being offer. Um, what the paper does is it sets out an overview of absence uh, over the last few months uh, and gives you some trend analysis, um, looking at the past and also um, some of the planning for the future. Um, and also the paper sets out where we are with those six interventions in terms of some of the um, outcomes and activities. And generally speaking, um, the paper sets um, a fairly positive trend. Um, but we do recognise that there is still more work to do in this area um, and very happy, obviously, over the coming months to keep our executive board member updated on this progress, obviously our senior officers and, of course, this scrutiny. Um, so maybe if I pause there, Chair, and I'm more than happy to open it up to any observations and questions. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, if board members want to ask a question, please indicate in the usual way. Um, as no one's indicating, I'll, I'll start. So just um, in terms of the the challenge, uh, Councillor Burke, did you indicate? Sorry, yeah. Hi, right, thank you. So just on in terms of um, just a bit more on context, um, I'm sure you're aware that uh, one of the budget savings this year was around vacancy management. Um, and I just wanted to get your take on whether that's increasing fresh one staff and how we're supporting staff through the additional workloads that are coming because of uh, budget pressures. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so yes, as this was an issue, um, as scrutiny knows, that came out for the peer review as well, which was undertaken at the end of last year. Um, in terms of the financial uh, pressure in the organisation, but also um, absence uh, management levels, yes, we're very mindful that does have a pressure on uh, working patterns and workloads. Um, and as an organisation, obviously, we put more effort and, and more resource within those support areas. Um, a whole range of different interventions, some of them that we've actually mentioned in the paper, Chair, um, some of them are more than happy to tease out if it is uh, useful to do so. Um, generally speaking, though, our focus on those pressures that you've referenced has been predominantly on building and strengthening our more general well-being offer and support across the organisation, rather than just the focus on dealing with people who are um, off sick. Um, and also one of the key priorities over that period has been the focus on managerial uh, capacity and capability. So the scrutiny board will be aware of the investment we made and the Be Your Best programme. And a lot of that intervention has been supporting training managers in terms of managing their workforce, managing workloads, but also supporting them more generally in terms of service delivery. And that's the, been the more generic framework that we've offered. OK, thank you very much, Andy. OK, Councillor Burke. Thanks, Chair. Can I ask, um, the report talks about your recruitment of the three attendance coordinators. Can I ask in practical terms what their role actually is going to be? Because it says it's going to support managers. But practically, what will that look like? Thank you, Councillor Burke. Um, yeah, just in relation to that, the, the supporting the managers really on the front line. So um, predominantly within the CEL services where those three attendance management um, 
resources have been put in place and um, what they're actually doing is supporting the manager so when people are calling in with um calling sick kind of dealing with the calls dealing with the administration and the the um, process around the managing attendance making sure there's the regular contact um and and you know kind of managing people through the framework of the managing attendance policy that's kind of keeping on top of it and and we find that when we've got the interventions in place and we really kind of um on top of you know the conversations with individuals supporting their well-being it has a positive impact on people returning to work as well I do have another question. So we talk about in the report about the um, Fair Work Charter, uh, which is from West Yorkshire. And I know this is a bit of a projection, but how do you think that will impact? Um, I think because the Fair Work Charter is still in that development phase, um, as you know, Councillor Burke, I think the original intention was that it would have been launched by now. Um, but that group um, focusing on the delivery and the implementation is still working hard on that. And as a council, we are contributing to that. The Fair Work Charter will certainly make reference, I think, to um, workforce wellbeing, health and wellbeing issues. Um, and we're confident that quite a lot of those issues we've already um, focused on and delivering as an individual organisation. Um, but I think our commitment will certainly be to sign up to that um, Fair Work Charter. In terms of the detail, it's difficult to say because obviously it's still in that development phase. Um, but I, I'm convinced, though, that it will deliberately and specifically reference wellbeing issues. Sorry, my final one is you. you know, it's interesting about the Fair Work Charter because I have been waiting for that to come out. Um, so I'm not sure. Looking at your priority service areas around absenteeism or lack of days, working days lost, should I say? Do you have you broken this information down further into groups? So perhaps by gender, perhaps by one of the other protected characteristics. And I think we can almost, when you look at the areas, it's almost possible to guess, isn't it? Part-time workers, women um, around cleaning and things like that, because they are usually typically from those groups. I just wondered if you'd gone further and drilled down into that information and if we could perhaps look at that. Thank you, Councillor Burke. Yes, we have not particularly in for this report, but um, for the wider report across um, the whole of the council, we have looked at protected characteristics across the piece and um, the proportion of people that are on um, sickness at the moment do correlate with the proportion of what you would expect in terms of the, the protected characteristics. We can do some further work to drill down in terms of these particular services, um, because at the moment we've done it more at a high level cross directorate. Um, but we can take that away and pick that up. Thank you. I would just, I kind of guess what I was trying to tease out is sometimes if you are looking at part time or, or women workers, they have particular problems that they could perhaps have some additional support with. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Councillor Burke. Okay, I'm going to bring in Councillor Ritchie next. Thanks, Chair. Um, do we. Um recognize and, and accept that the increase in um sort of non-specific viruses is is potentially due to the end of covid where people have been isolating and now mixing there seems to be a lot more bugs out there which will be impacting staff and that might be more prevalent as well with public facing staff um so do we recognize that when we're dealing with it that's one question and related to that are we still um promoting and using the um good advice from um that came out of covid around hygiene so we've still got hand sanitizers in public buildings that are topped up and what have you that's my first question uh, thank you councillor richie um yeah no i think you're right so i think we have seen um quite high levels of um viral infection um it's difficult to judge the residual impact of covid when people are returning into um a workplace but i think there's some anecdotal evidence of that um 
and not least, I think because sickness absence levels tend to be higher in frontline services in those workplaces where perhaps they are more populated or engaging with members of the public uh, and the like. So we're very aware that there is a, uh, a difference um, between our sickness levels in certain work environments. So I think that probably will be um, due to that uh, issue that you've rightly raised. Um, and linked to that, obviously, it is important, therefore, that we do continue to provide advice and guidance to staff on that good personal hygiene. Um, so we do periodically reissue the guidance. So, so that is online. That goes through our uh, ongoing comms. As you'd expect, we work closely with public health because obviously they are also banging the drum on those types of um, important key messages. Um, it's probably a, a, an opportune time now to have another go at that, um, to make sure that those messages are getting across. Um, and as well as public health, our health and safety team are also very mindful of that. And I think the, that granular level of analysis that Claire referred to does help us to know where best to target. So when we can see um, viral infections spiking in a particular service, it does enable us then to, to go in and have a look at some of those um, prevention measures that you referenced. Thank you. And my second question is just around, and I know great strides have been made around around this, um, but around um, support for women going through the menopause, which again might increase sickness levels, which um, obviously don't, don't relate to men. So if you just perhaps articulate some of the work around that, please. Thank you, Councillor Ritchie. Yeah, we've, we've been doing a lot of work around menopause um, at the moment. So we've got um, a really good toolkit um, on Insight that provides information. We've been promoting the Let's Talk um, menopause sessions. So we've managed to kind of make sure that they can support individuals. We have picked up that we haven't had quite as many male colleagues going on to those courses. So we are doing some work to promote that and to make sure that they, you know, kind of attend the courses and get a better understanding so they can support colleagues. Um, it is a topic that comes up quite regularly. We often speak about it at the, the corporate JCC meetings and with trade union colleagues at, at various meetings through the um through the normal process. Um, so it's something we're very mindful of. Um, it's not coming through as a kind of high indicator on the stats, but it depends on obviously what people are actually reporting as the reason for for absence. Um, but yeah, trying to really push push the support around menopause. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Ritchie. Okay, move on to Councillor Gruen. Thank you. Um, a general question from me, because the, the report does refer to um, uh, data monitoring, obviously. And I'm just wondering, how do you actually know that the interventions you're putting in place have re have resulted in the reduction of absence that you the, the paper claims, in a sense? Now, I'm sure your stats will tell you that, but it's not evident from the paper that there is that cause and effect. So that's my first question. And the second question I'm only asking, really, because in a, in a different life years ago, um, I was involved in implementing similar sorts of interventions as a manager. And I, I'm wondering what the perception of the workforce is of some of these interventions. Do, they, do you feel that it's looked upon in a very positive way? Or do you feel there might be examples of people feeling over monitored or picked on, as it were? Because um, I think that's a really important link in the chain. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Green. Um, your cause and effect issue is really interesting because obviously there are lots of factors that impact on people's ill health and their attendance. Um, so we also have to be quite cautious about the direct impact of some of our interventions. But what we can be confident about is where we've put that specific support that we have already referenced in those um, sort of 12 or 13 specific services where we've had more resource, more effort, um, more input, we have seen a sharper decline in ill health and absence. So we can be fairly confident that those interventions are working. Um, and, and that's when you compare to those other services where they've not had as much um, specific support. Um, but obviously, we have to be always very mindful about the data. Mindful at this time of year, which Councillor Rich is referred to, is that there's obviously se seasonal trends as well with absence. So we have to sort of look in the whole. Um, but the more data capture we can do, the more confident we can be that specific interventions work or perhaps don't work. So um, it's a fair point, but we just have to be diligent about that issue. Um, your issue about perception, again, is a really important issue. I, I think, generally speaking, what we try to pitch with our 
um, absence interventions is that more holistic approach. So rather than focus on the managerial interventions in terms of taking individuals through um, systems and processes, we have focused very much on that broader well-being piece to support individuals back into the workplace, to make sure that their working environment is as strong and positive as it can be to prevent ill health in the first place. Um, and that broader supportive environment is really important to us. Um, but obviously where we are doing the more targeted, um, you know, that perception, yes, people in certain services may perceive it differently. Um, one of the key issues that we are obviously focusing on shortly over the next few weeks is that we'll go live with our new staff survey. So that's a really good opportunity for us to capture people's perceptions on some of these issues. Um, so perhaps the scrutiny board invite us back in a few months, we'll have some more of the results on that. So we might be in a stronger, better position to um, update you on that. Thank you. Uh, and I was going to ask the menopause question. So thank you for your response on that. I was going to follow it up by asking um, what the absence rate is that give the reason of menopause. But I think you've kind of answered that by saying a lot of people probably don't label it as menopause. So we don't really have that indication, but it's a really important issue. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Gruen. Can bring Councillor Flynn next? Uh, hi, Andy. Um, I know it's very early days in 2023. Um, is there any indication in, in February that that uh, flat line has sort of continued or, or will it start to sort of go down? Uh, and um, is there any correlation between sickness levels uh, and working from home? What, what if, Perhaps using the right expressions, what's the long term prognosis uh, so far as you see? Yeah, um, I think we're expecting the levels of ill health and absence to continue on the trend set out in the paper, um, partly because of the point I made earlier about that seasonality of ill health and, and Councillor Richie, Richie's point about um, viral infection and people perhaps returning um, onto public transport, returning into the workplace. Um, so I'm hoping as we move into better weather, into that sort of spring summer period, sickness generally does decrease anyway. So we're positive that we will continue to see that that downward trend. Um, and also, I think, as some of the interventions we talked about today, also in bed. Um, but obviously, um, there are sometimes matters outside our hand, um, our, outside our control. So we'll just have to keep monitoring that. Um, in terms of the split between frontline staff and those staff that can perhaps work through that hybrid model or uh, work from home or flexibly, um, we have seen a variation in that. So we have seen sickness, generally speaking, higher um, for those staff who are working frontline um, and 100% um, in a uh, working environment rather than working from home, um, where sickness absence tends to be recorded as lower for those um, working from home staff. The, the, the types of illness from, for people working from home, do they differ from the types of illness that are reported for uh, people who are, well, frontline staff, for argument's sake, say? Um, I, would, I would have to double check that correlation, but I don't think they do. Um, so I, I think the trends that we've um, set out in terms of the most common reasons for ill health um, are probably similar for those types of variation. I think probably the only exception to that I would expect would be musculoskeletal ill health, which will, is likely to be higher for those who are on front line um, than those working from home. Um, that's my uh, assumption, but without going back and, and double checking the figures. Um, but I don't think we're seeing any great variation in terms of the other key reasons for ill health. So that's obviously the viral infections uh, and also um, mental ill health. I think that's pretty much the same between those different um, categories of staff. Thank you very much. OK, Councillor Chapman. Thank you. Um, got a couple, two or three questions. Um, the... Rick, most, the January number is still a lot higher than the last normal year in 2019. It says in the report that COVID has dropped out of the top three reasons in from November 2022. I just wondered how many days it still accounts for out of that increase. 
Thank you, Council Chapman. Um, to be honest, I would have to go back and double check it for you. I can provide the numbers after the meeting. Um, we saw the we saw the drop in COVID when the testing stopped um, as being predominant as what it was in the past. So it started being infections. It, potentially, it could still be COVID, but if people aren't testing, we don't get obviously the same results and they, and they wouldn't obviously kind of show us as COVID. But I can get you the figures in terms of the, the numbers. Uh, thank you. I think what I'm, I'm trying to get at is what is the reason behind that 2.43 increase if it's not COVID and it is mental health, which you just say that's the biggest single reason. Um, do we know what's driving that mental health increase? Is it is there a correlation with departments with vac high vacancy rates or where we've reduced the staff? As in we're putting the staff that are left under more pressure and driving that? Thank you, Councillor Chapman. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it's generally a rise across um, other authorities as well. So we've done some benchmarking work to kind of see whether or not other authorities are experiencing the same. So I think generally people, um, you know, the, the, the issue that Councillor Richie raised earlier in the fact that people are picking up more infections than maybe they were before because people's immune systems are slightly um, down compared to what we were before COVID because people weren't mixing. So we have seen a kind of higher increase in the infection rate. So I think that's probably part of it. I think generally in terms of mental health, I think going through COVID has had a, a, a negative impact on a lot of people. And we have seen that increase in uh, mental health following that, which many other local authorities have also seen. Um, we haven't kind of seen a direct link between, and again, it's the causation bit, isn't it? It's difficult to always kind of show that causation. So we haven't seen a direct link in terms of particular areas where people are reporting that, you know, there's increased workload or pressure. We haven't seen anything where there's a direct correlation between the two. Um, but again, it's something that we can kind of keep an eye on. Um, and obviously it's kind of what we've been trying to do is work on that prevention to sort of support people and recognize people's health and well-being um, and support and support people to kind of maintain a good. Um, good mental health. Um, not sure if that answers your question enough. Yeah, uh, yeah thank you. One more. Um, the chart that we've got that shows the days lost per FTE, given what we've just been talking about, can we break that down into um, MSK, the musculoskeletal mental health, and then other sick absence, or COVID, and then other sick absence to give us an idea of what's yeah where the problems are yeah can, thank you council chairman yes we can do that um we can break down however however you want the stats really we've tried to kind of keep the information as high level as possible so we don't get drawn into um you know it, it starts to get a bit complicated when we start breaking it across directorates and services and um sick types of sickness and what have you as well but if there's anything particular so we can look at maybe the top three levels of sick, reasons for sickness and kind of give you a breakdown in terms of how that's looking thank you very much okay Councillor Amis. Okay. Can someone help with the blind? Yeah, it's right on the back. Good. Okay. Are there any other questions? I can't see any. I, th I think this is really helpful. Thank you, Andy. I think um, my t my take is that uh, the, the work we're doing is good. I think there's um, I think we need to look at maybe next year. Look at the balance between. I think I think as a good employee, you need to do uh, support and challenge. And so hopefully we can talk about challenge maybe at another meeting. I think that would be good as well. Um, but with that, I close this item. Thank you very much for coming. Really appreciate your input and look forward to get, getting that additional input information. If you send that through uh, Rob Clayton, he'll share that with the board. Super. Thank you very much. Okay. So we're going to move on to um, item uh, seven, oops, item eight, which is page um, 27 of your pack. And we've got John here. I think you're going to do a presentation to start with. Um, give you up to 15 minutes to do your presentation, John. Thank you. Sorry, Councillor Scopes, you've got me a bit more apologies. Um, John just asked me just to to kickstart um, the EDI agenda, and then I promise I will move on to John. Um, really just to say a couple of things from me on this item. So obviously the scrutiny board has received quite a number of reports on EDI since 2020. Um, and really for me just to stress that it remains a significant area of priority for the council with our overarching aim and our goal to demonstrate that strong commitment to ensure that every member of staff can bring their full and best selves into the workplace 
And also just to stress that we have and continue to have a very strong commitment to root out inequality and discrimination in the workplace as well. Um, so John's presentation is really setting out um, the journey that we're on. Um, and um, as a board, you've heard quite a lot over the last year, two years from the staff networks uh, and other key partners on that journey. But John will just share with you now some of the broader organisational corporate uh, interventions um, to deliver that goal. Thank you, John. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Andy. And thanks for that clear statement, because I think that's really important for anyone who's listening. And that's why it's been here lots of times in the last uh, last few years. Just give it. This is a hopefully a standard for our test. So we'll just let let this go and then we'll ring in John. I was uh, just getting to the point where I was going to ask everyone to leave, but uh, fortunately it is a, it's a test. As I was saying, this is a really important item. I appreciate your statement and I know it's a, a priority for Councillor Cooper and others as well. So that's really important. Thank you. Okay, over to you, John. Yeah, morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for that intro, Andy. I think um, yeah, the boss and I are doing a double lap this morning. I didn't get a memo with the tie, but we've got the same <laughs> colour shirt. So at least I'm, I'm doing something right. Um, Thank you, Councillor Scope, also for your introduction. This agenda is not just important. I've always said it's agenda of our time. Uh, we came to scrutiny um, in February, I think, to present to you a fairly detailed report on where we got to. And I think that's in the pack uh, from page 31 to 39, it's a 10 page report setting up what we're trying to do. So this is a follow on um, kind of update in terms of where we got to. And I want to spend time on what we're actually doing. Um, and I take Councillor Groen's earlier question before around um, impact and how do we know we're making a difference. I want to spend a bit of time on that part of it. But clearly, this is an important agenda. And the EDI agenda fits in with all our work, um, not just in terms of what managers are doing, but more broadly, as I've always said to the team, we have to make the extraordinary feel ordinary. That's when we know we're making an impact. So this becomes commonplace. And when we're not doing extra work around this stuff, because it needs to be and will be, you know, something that we do as a as a regular basis. So it, it fits in broadly with our strategy for the organization as a whole. It's centered to everything that we do, and it's not a, a standalone. Next slide, Rob. Thank you. So I wanted to begin at the top. Um, we've seen real clear leadership on this agenda, not just from scrutiny board, um, but but in terms of our leadership, both in terms of the executive board and our senior leaders. So we took a paper to executive board in February to sign off our broad approach on EDI. And you can see there, our focus is three areas. Number one, our people in communities. So what we're doing as an organization out with. Um, and then in terms of service delivery, what are managers doing every day uh, when they're delivering services to our communities where EDI plays a central role. And then lastly, I guess, which is my area of focus, what are we doing with our people? And uh, that they are most important asset. How do we embed um, those values that we say are important to us on EDI? Next slide, Rob. So just to counter through some progression, um, I, mean, I came on board around this time last year um, to support on this agenda. We've done quite a number of um, important things already, um, much more than that, but I thought I'd give you a very, very brief summary of some of the key stuff. And when I came in April and 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 had a way with Andy and certainly had a way with Councillor Cooper, um, I was made to to understand in no certain terms that we need to review our practice in terms of grievance um, in the organization. Our policies are actually broadly okay, but the experience of our staff um, need to be looked at. So we've done that work, completed the new recommendations to the organization um, around sort of 17 executive summary findings, 15 recommendations um, around key areas, and we're implementing that as we speak. So I can talk about that a bit later. Uh, secondly, on staff networks, certainly uh, this particular board has had a real focus on that. You heard from all seven of them. Every single one has come to you to share their lived experience. We think that's really important. Because we have to match that against our intent. 
Um, and our intent, in my view, is unquestionable. We know what we're doing around this agenda, but you know, is that bearing out in terms of um, the views and um, and experiences of our of our staff? So you've heard that from them, um, unfiltered and direct. Um, in December, uh, we will come with a much more clear approach in terms of our workforce priorities. I'll talk about that later, and there are five of them, and that's from the basis of our work going forward um, on the workforce EDI priorities. Uh, on training, which again I'll touch on, we've launched a mandatory training um, for all of our 2,200 managers. That's a significant undertaking, and there are five stages to that process. Again, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. And then next steps after all of this, what does this mean? Why are we doing all this stuff? Uh, and where, where are we headed? And it's really all about embedding EDI um, in the organization. And we're already making progress. Uh, you'll have heard of our Stonewall um, latest result where we, uh, we're in the top 100. We're LGBT gold accredited employer. We're you know, disability confident leader. So there's lots of external focus um, telling us we're doing the right things, but we're not complacent. There's a lot of work to do. Next slide, Rob. So I mentioned the staff networks. The, you know, they are the voice of the organization. They're the ones who kind of hold our feet to the coast quite rightly. And, and, and you know, they're doing a really good work um, on that. You've heard from a newly appointed Freedom Speak of Guardian and her new, unique, independent role that we brought to the organization, which obviously didn't exist before. No other local authority has this role. Um, it's a role that sits in health and social care. And um, we've seen it fit to bring that role into our organization to add to the existing approaches, provide you know, free, clear, unfettered approach on EDI um, to our leadership team. Next slide. So what have we done so far? Here's some examples of the, the work on the ground. I've mentioned the city, city vision statement um, that went to executive board, that's now clear what we mean by EDI, what are we going to do about it, underpinned by an action plan um, for the next two years, covering um, those five priorities that I'll take you through in a minute. Um, we looked at our, our governance to ensure that it is robust. Um, the commitment of the leadership and partnership approach is, is clear, executive board, scrutiny board, CLT, equality boards, um, race for equality network, which, um, which, which was so it's brought in by Councillor Cooper. Um, the work we're doing at Anchors, we've just spoken about the Fair Work Charter, our staff networks. So there's quite a lot of stuff going, going on on the ground to make sure this is just not policy, but we're embedding that in a real sense. Um, the zero tolerance statement that we issued back in March, um, and there's been follow-on work after that, and we're just about to review that and release more information around, around zero tolerance based on what we're doing with our children and adults direct threats, so that's coming out, being very clear to our managers what we mean by all of this stuff to support the training. And you can see there, we're telling our managers that they must act, um, if they see or hear anything, they've got to take on the responsibility of being managers in this space, and we're supporting them to do that. We can't hold them accountable if we're not providing them with the training and support. So it's also a high support and yet high challenge approach on all of this. Um, and the work we're doing around discrimination and poor behavior, and there's lots going on on the ground in terms of how we give our managers the opportunity to challenge um, and raise the issue if they need to do so. In terms of events and ongoing engagement, I'll talk about that briefly in a minute. There's a whole slew of work we're doing around making this stuff real, and the events provide the mechanic to do that. Next slide, please. So I mentioned the five workforce priorities um, for us, and, and they're there. Recruitment and work on data monitoring, Speaking up in zero tolerance training and progression. I'll go through some detail um, at the next slide drop and, uh, and pull out some key points. So five strands of work, real work um, going on right now in each of those strands. Um, I'll just pull out some key highlights. So in the first column around recruitment and initial welcome, we have a uh, put together a task and finish group looking at those points in orange um, bullet points. So how do we shortlist our panels diverse? What does representation look like? And we're putting together a draft framework to go to our leadership team, CLT, to sign off. And that's nearly complete. That um, task and finish group is made up of 
about 15 people across organization from different places, different grades. So it's grade agnostic from a director all the way down to um, as well lower grade staff. And it's bringing all that voice into place to say, how do we make sure all this stuff, all these policies that we have in place are real and making a difference? So that's providing guidance to our, our managers on what they should do to, make, to ensure they have a diverse panel when they're recruiting. What does that mean? We're also putting together a pool of colleagues to form a diverse pool. So you can ask for people to come and help you interview if you haven't got diversity in your team to do that. So it, that's real meaningful work. The other example around progression, which I'll touch on very quickly, lots of work around what do you mean by positive action? Because actually that's a real way of making change. But we need to be clear what that means with our managers. And that group is looking at that to set out clearly for managers what we mean by positive action as opposed to positive discrimination, which clearly um, is illegal. On training, that's probably the area where we've done um, the most work um, and there's real progress on, on that. So we reviewed all our training provision. We've agreed it was mandatory. We've agreed the model to, to deliver that. Um, we're delivering it. We started delivering the model already and, and we're reporting on the uptake um, on that. And I'll touch on that briefly soon. And I've talked about aligning this to our leadership management offer already. Um, and on zero tolerance, again, I've covered that in terms of the, the review that we've done and the work we're bringing forward to make sure uh, that we embed those recommendations from the report that we've already set out. Um, and part of that, in terms of improving our consistency consistent of approach, is lots of work around the early stages of grievances. So can we mediate issues really quickly? Um, and we're already doing that. We're, we're taking paper, in, in fact, this week to our HR team on how we improve our mediation process and what we're going to do about that. Um, and very quickly on, on the last the last column there on data and monitoring, um, how do we know this stuff is working? How are we making a difference? So we've done lots of work with the um, with, with the least um, center for data analytics and we're just about to release a a new data dashboard on edi that will provide our managers with the ability to know what they look like at a service level so you can plug in your service and identify against the council's data set against the 2020 2021 census what do you look like as a service how representative are you right do you have any particular gaps so to give you a clear picture you will know exactly at a service level what you look like and i think that's really important that, that, that we do that because the data doesn't lie we have to go to where the data sends us we are being very careful though that we don't go too low that we identify individuals uh, who don't want to be identified we need to be careful of that there'll be a there'll be a cutoff point of numbers maybe five or ten employees because we use myself for example, and you, and you plug in HR, and you plug in GNC level, and you plug in, um, um, I suppose, racial identity, I will stick out. So we need to be careful how we do that. The data is anonymized, of course, but you must be able to know at a glance what you look like as a service. And we're making that available to them. Next slide, please. So I've covered this already in terms of work we've done, 157. Uh, listening sessions, which I did myself. I listened to people um, across all the stakeholderships. So staff, trade union colleagues, managers, senior leadership teams, um, and you know, and, and heard from them directly what it feels like to go through a, a process and organization. And, and you can see the findings um, that I, I talked about earlier. So we, we've completed that and we're on our way to embed the recommendations. Next slide, please. So why? Why would you know this stuff? What, what's the focus um, on training meaning for us? Clearly, we want to make sure our organization is inclusive. And we have a work to a fair approach. We celebrate difference and we value um, difference and eliminate discrimination. And we're really big on making sure everybody feels comfortable being their whole self, bringing your whole self to work. It's something that we talk about a lot. That's why we're doing this, because that makes for a better a better organization. I think I mentioned in, the, in February when I came about those three things that we need to do it. So there's a legal requirement. Um, we want to do it because actually, if you've got a good performing team, we know you'll be more efficient and you get more productivity out of your team. And thirdly, you know, we, you know, we should do it in terms of a moral obligation as a as a huge organization leads with impact across our communities. Next slide, please. 
So again, let's talk about what's happening really on the ground and not just what's on paper. It's a five-step training program. Um, as you can see there, step one was a, a session with our CLT um, directors and, and Tom, our chief exec, with, with our 2,200 managers. So it was a virtual session, half an hour, setting up very clearly our leadership journey, right? So as a manager in this organization, understand why we're doing this, have the opportunity to engage with our leaders, raise questions, be clear on what's coming down the line in terms of this journey. So we did that. Step two was myself and my team going out to services and, and having a conversation around if we're putting together this training program on EDI, how do you make sure it's fit for purpose? So what are the challenges in your service that we need to be aware of so we can build that in into the plan? We've done that, completed. We're now in step three. We're now delivering the training sessions to all our managers. We're about 20 sessions in. So we've covered about nearly 1,000 out of 2,200 managers, which is quite an undertaking. Each session is two and a half hours long. As I said, it's face-to-face, -face, and we have about 40-ish managers in each session from across the organization. And we're having real conversations about this change. This is where change is happening, right? And this is where those conversations are making a difference. Yes, we can train you on, on all the stuff you need to know, but, you know, this stuff about allowing people to express what's difficult, where the challenge is, um, you know, together as managers, understanding where we're going on this journey, really vital. So I think that face-to-face -face step three is probably the biggest bit of it all. The expectation then, step four, is that you go as a manager and a very simple page, but not asking it to you to do too much. It's not onerous. Simple A4, three objectives. What are you going to do? You know your service is best. How are you going to do it? And when are you going to do it? And they're supported with a massive resource package online, um, almost like a pick, you know, uh, pick and mix session to pull up, pull out any tools you need to help you deliver that. And then step five is also making sure we embed this in the appraisals of managers so we can have a look through how you're making a difference and celebrate success and share best practice across the organization. And we're, we're on, on, on through that until at least June this year when we will deliver the training for the 2020 managers. Next slide, please. So I just want to... John, to just to say you've had your 15 minutes. I'll let you uh, carry on. But, I just uh, got two more slides. Yeah, thank I'll you. Now be done. Um, just quickly on events. I think sometimes we, we underestimate events. It's a real way of, of making this real, of recognizing the diversity of what we're doing. So I won't go through all of it. There's a lot of stuff we're doing on a regular calendarized basis, making sure this stuff is real with managers. Last slide, I think, if I'm right. Oh, two more. So quickly, <laughs> nearly there. So um, I want to make sure we, we, we kind of talk briefly around that e equality improvement priorities, how this links together as one sensible aligned story. Clearly, we have a, a such requirement as a public organization anyway. I mentioned that, um, and we report you know, annually on this. And all the EDI that we're doing, that snapshot of activity feeds into our equality improvement priorities. So there's a real evidence-based approach to the work. Next slide, please. Final slide, you'd be pleased to know. So I just want to do a very quick summary of, of kind of you said we did, because there were some real questions asked of us on this agenda um, across the last couple of years or so, and we are doing stuff, real stuff. Um, give us past review, I won't mention that, I've covered that enough. Um, give clear support to staff networks, we're doing that, you heard from them. Um, they've got a budget now secured, so they've got that kind of um, confidence to crack on and do stuff. They've got protected time that we sign up for CLT, so they can have that confidence to go on and do stuff. Um, there's a, there's a, they had, they're meeting with our director of resources, now on a regular basis as a staff forum leadership network. So getting direct access to leadership of the organization around any issues that we want to raise. We're told there's a lack of knowledge and, and on EDI skills in the organization where we're delivering and have launched the EDI training session. Lots and lots and lots going on. Happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, John. It's really good to see that. Uh, you said we did slide at the end. Um, I'm going to going to bring in uh questions from uh as we go just quick two from me i thought it was really really positive that you said a thousand managers 
ever really done that. I assume it would be mandatory for new managers as they get recruited and promoted. Um, you're nodding. And the second one was just around how busy the um, Speak Up Guardian is. You know. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Scopes. Um, so the the Speak Up Guardian role, I think, has about um, 50 or 60 cases she's working on at the minute that she's working through. 80. 80, so I've corrected 80, I undercut it. Um, 80 cases that she's working through at the moment. So she's fairly busy, clearly, and she's obviously um, of use. Obviously, 80 people feel confident to talk to her. And obviously, each individual case is, is, is can be quite um, complex, but they are using her regularly and speaking to her. Good, thank you. It's to sort of well that you'd hope that in time would be less busy. Uh, Marianne, do you want to come in? Yeah, just to add to um, John, Vanessa is busy, but it's important. Obviously, some of those um, issues being raised are around DDI and, and how people are feeling, lived experience. But as you'll know from your briefing about the session, it is also about other types of concerns, you know, where we might be letting customers down or, you know, people might be, um, you know, kind of bad practice, that kind of thing. And people are concerned. So not all of the 80 will necessarily be around uh, EDI, but she is busy. And, and as you know, we've committed that she'll update scrutiny at some point later in the year as well. Thank you very much. OK, Councillor Almas. Thank you, Chair. I think uh, you covered the. My question was around uh, uh, the uh, the Guardian freedom of speak to speak of Guardian. I think uh, that's uh, really we, we we welcome that position and um, really interesting report as well. Uh, in terms of monitoring and whatever you've you've uh, mentioned the uh, the eighty figure and so on, uh, but in terms of actually uh, measuring success, because there's a lot of stuff there you know the guardian the guardian works independently and impartially ac across the council they're not connected to hr they're not connected to management or trade unions uh, uh and and they're reporting directly to the chief executive and whatever you what sort of i mean in terms of the actual um measuring success of this role uh what are your thoughts around that and uh, how often is that kind of um uh, is, is 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 that um uh, monitored thank you even though it's quite a new position, I understand that. So, Mariana, Mariana's looking at me. I think she wants to come in. Before she comes in, I, I think you make a very important point, Councillor Armas. Um, we're very clear that that role does not sit in HR. Really important point. Has full independence, and colleagues can contact her directly, anonymously, and if they choose to um, make themselves identifiable, they can do that. Because, in fact, some of the points that go through to her you come back to us as HR if it's in relevance to us to resolve. And then honestly, I don't know who the individual is. You just say there's a case. Can we have a response? I think that's really important. We maintain that impartiality. But I'll let Marina cover the um, reporting bit. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, I mean, it links to a couple of the conversations we've already had actually about measuring cause and effect. It will be quite difficult to measure the impact of Vanessa per se. Um, and it's probably worth us being fairly honest about that because it is quite complex. Um, that said, I think, you know, some of the measures we'll use will, you know, also take a little while to come through. So, you know, what I think we'll do, um, there'll obviously be a almost an element of satisfaction from those who actually register. So that is, you know, Vanessa will engage with those colleagues and say, are you happy with the way that your um, issue has been handled? So that's a very direct from those that have actually raised a, uh, a concern. The next layer, I think, will be just, it, it, because it's about organisational culture and how people feel, that's why it will be quite tricky to assess. But I think, as Andy said, you know, we might get some indications through the staff survey later on in the year because it is about how people will feel. Um, and then I think what we'll what we're after Vanessa doing is probably doing a, a, like an annual report each year about how many she's had, what are the themes that they have um, raised, what has the organisations done about them, um, and that's how we'll measure success. But it won't be a you know, kind of an impact on the bottom line or a really clear, tangible, um, just one thing. I think it'll be much more organic than that. 
thank you. And since it's quite a unique position, obviously, first in the UK, in terms of going forward, do you think one position uh, is enough? Uh, and secondly, in terms of ongoing training and development as well, because it's quite a unique position, as we as we know. So what sort of support mechanism have you got in place in terms of actually supporting the position, making it more in, uh, you know, effective and, and having maximum impact? Yeah, no, really good questions that, to be honest, we're wrestling with at the moment because, um, you know, we have appointed her. It is the first council to do so. But importantly, it is quite well established, as John said, in quite a lot of NHS functions. So one place that Vanessa gets quite a lot of support from is colleagues um, in the city in um, NHS organisations. There is also a national office of Freedom to Speak Up Guardians. Um, so there's almost there's a, a you know, an expert set of practitioners and way of doing things, um, which again, Vanessa hooks into. Um, and um, I think I'm okay to say this, you know, we have also made sure that she's got the kind of right professional supervision for the role because she is exposed to some quite, you know, kind of tough stuff to listen to. Um, so as an organisation, in terms of her well-being, we've made sure that she's got that support. Um, she sees Tom, I think, every month, um, and I see her at, at least every fortnight just to make sure that she is OK. Um, the question about capacity is one that we are really mulling over. Um, but we're reluctant to make too quick a judgment on that, because ideally, if she can get into more proactive work, we would get fewer concerns and her work would be a bit more of a mixture of taking some concerns, but really working and supporting managers to do their job in the best way possible. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you for that. Councillor Cooper, do you want to come in? Yeah, if I could just add um, to what uh, John and Mariana have said about, <clears throat> excuse me, the Speak Up Guardian, just to say that um, it is a priority for uh, the organisation um, and for us as um, executive board, um, from, um, you know, the chief exec to the leader to myself around the Speak Up Guardian, um so we are on a learning process it's the first year of uh, Vanessa's work so um it's a it's a little bit of a, a, a test as we go and learn and uh, and adapt as we uh, as we find out um you know the uh, process that she's undertaking and what it raises and what we need to deal with so um I would imagine we will be evaluating that at the um, end of the year and so on about what next steps we need to take but please take it from me it's an absolute priority uh, for us as a as an organization that 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 will continue yeah thank you very much really good questions there councillor it's really important to make sure we get this get this right good okay i'm going to bring in councillor gruen next thank you um, I've got two questions. The first one is about the staff networks approach, which I think you said was quite unique to Leeds, and I think it's an excellent approach. Um, we did hear from the chairs at one of our meetings here, um, and one the, a point that was made, I think, by more than one of them, is that attendance can be an issue because uh, although they are given the time and it's a valued activity, uh, we're all the same, aren't we? Something much more pressing comes along at the last minute and you feel you have to forfeit your presence at that meeting because X needs to be done. Uh, I'm just wondering if there's anything you could do to ease that pressure so we could get the attendance back up again, because I think it's a really important part of the programme that you're putting in place. Um, so that was the first part of the question. With my um, Council Armed Forces uh, champion hat on and Covenant Responsibilities, can we start an EDI veterans group, do you think? It, it, would that be would that fit in? Because the Covenant's responsibility is very much about equalities and access to services and so on. Um, so I would like to see that happen if I could. And I'll come back with a second question. Thank you, Councillor Gruen. Um, on the attendance issue, we've made it a integral part of the mandatory training that staff networks. Um, is covered within that. So all our training tools, our videos, we have a real lived experience of staff networks. They talk about what they do, why it's important. So all the managers that come to your training, every each, every single one of them gets to know exactly the value that they're adding. And that should support 
attendance. The training is mandatory, so you, you can't choose whether you want to come or not. Um, also, we've had the staff network chairs attend the sessions. Uh, sometimes they sit at the back and listen, and then they, they sometimes they speak to managers around what they're doing. So we're, we're embedded the idea that this is not actually a, 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 a nice to have. It's making a real impact on your staff, on your teams. So managers get to hear what, what value they're adding. Um, I've talked about the protected time that we've given to um, the networks um, from the, the care and the steering group to colleagues who want to participate, right? So there's a, an agreed um, leadership in the CLT signed off time that people can have to join the network, to participate in the activities and so on and so forth. And in fact, the last one I went to, the um, the Women's Voice Network, which is the IWD, International Women's Day event, was a full, full house. In, in civic so staff are coming out and joining but i think you're right we need to probably need to do more to communicate that to managers to say you know staff do have protected time to attend and be involved in network activities um on the armed forces adi veterans group i'm sure we can um have a conversation with you on how best we do that whilst my focus is internal workforce we don't exist in a vacuum clearly and and colleagues like jeff temple who are working with me on the so corporate staff i'm sure we can have a conversation with you now we certainly bring our expertise to the table you know the knowledge you've gained over the last year or so and what we're doing on this agenda to support that we can have a, an offline conversation with you thank you very much i, I had actually thought about veterans who are staff uh, that that's where that thought stream was coming from but it, it may well be wider than that too if uh, we'll have it so i'll book a conversation with you um the second one was about the edi training and you've you've stressed how important that is and the fact that it's mandatory clearly again aimed at staff have forgive me if i've missed it but should we be having some edi training as uh, counselors Really good question, Councillor Gruen. And Councillor Kufa has raised this with me severally. Um, we are working on that. So the, the corporate training um, on EDR, if you like, for members probably come through um, my colleague, Jeff Temple. There's already a plan in place. We're working with Democratic Services team on how we deliver that. Um, at the least, it will be part of the um, induction if you're a new councillor. So you know, you've got to do that anyway. There are some some um mandatory training anyway if you sit on a on a on a plans panel you have to have that anyway so we have the roots in place we're just pulling together clearly how we deliver that across all members um across the organization but if council Cooper wants to come in on that yeah thanks thanks john <clears throat> and and thanks for the question councillor grew and it's uh, for me it's really important that elected members uh have access to um, uh, the training on um, EDI. There is already some on induction, um, but if you're already a counsellor, you don't necessarily have access to that. So for me, it's about uh, refresher training that uh, that may be needed, um, uh, and also uh, a bit more open access to uh, to other training that sometimes is available for staff and not necessarily uh, for members. Um, so it might be something that, as a scrutiny board, you want to perhaps look at one of the training sessions that's undertaken or what's you know something around that for me would uh, uh probably suit this board um and there may be a bit more take up if you have it at a, a um an organized session uh, as opposed to uh sometimes uh, when members undertake uh, uh sorry have access to training it's at specific times they might have um other commitments what other work uh commitments themselves are not necessarily able to always attend so if we can do it as part of the process uh of scrutiny i think that that'll really help as well here thank you councillor Cooper. I've, I've raised this that same question with john before and i, I think it one of the challenges from my perspective is um, mandating elected members to do stuff is a really difficult thing because we're not employed in the same way as the managers in the council are where we can say you need to attend this course. Um, okay, I'm going to bring in Councillor Burke next. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for your presentation, um, John. Can I ask um, just a couple of questions, surprisingly? The report talks about improving performance and rooting out inequality and raising inclusion. Can I ask what the original benchmark was? Because without an original benchmark, a starting point, you cannot show improvement in inverted commas. 
So whether that's number of grievances, number of, of cases taken forward, I, I'm just interested to know what you used as the original benchmark, because that will show, as well as anecdotal information, obviously you need statistical data that will show real improvement. That's question one. Um, the EDI task group, I'm particularly interested in that. So would it be possible, and I'm going to look at Andrew as well for this, if we could have a look at the terms of reference for that group, uh, because it's referred to continually, but without those terms of reference, not really sure what it's about. And my kind of supplementary to that is, can elected members, if they so wish, join be part of that because I certainly would be very interested. I'm just putting that out there. Um, next question. The secondment to the advisor to the group ends in March 23, which is now. So I'm very interested what the next steps would be because it's it's Oh, I didn't realise it was your role, so apologies for that. So, wow, bit of a strange question. Sorry, I didn't realise. But it's such an important role, isn't it? Um, if it's ending now, what's in place to take that forward to ensure that the momentum continues? I do have a big list, so I'll just ask you one more. The, the training, which I think is hugely important and, and vital, to raising the profile of any EDI in any organization. Two observations. One, I appreciate you can't do everything at once and Rome wasn't built in a day before somebody bites my head off. But actually, and you're right, managers do have a corporate responsibility, but in terms of EDI, that's the responsibility of every single person in this organization. So what are we doing about the employees who don't hold a managerial position because it's all our responsibilities and um, i'm sure you already know that will always be the case at any tribunal that everybody has a, re a responsibility and my last thing because i'm probably going to get shot down in a minute is around intersectionality and i do have a bit of a, a worry about lots of discrete groups because sometimes those discrete groups concentrate on their discreteness and it loses the focus, the overall umbrella around EDI, because when you put intersectionality into it, obviously things overlap, which one would I attend kind of thing when you don't need to have that protected characteristic. There's an argument about lived experience to promote equality. Yeah. Um. Thank you, Councillor Verek. I, I knew you had an interest in this area, but now I definitely know you have a huge interest in this area. <laughs> I, I'm, we'll try and pick up those questions. I mean, if you don't mind, the, the latter question around the row, I, I'll leave to my boss to, to come back to you on that. I think that's probably um, right and appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> right and appropriate. But um, you, you make some really good points. Um, let me take something one by one. On the India, India group, uh, let's have a conversation. I, I suppose... The group works really well because it is great agnostic, so we don't do great. Although the our director of adults is involved, Caroline Barry, she's always been involved, all the way down to a you know, C1 staff. So we get a really good mix of people. Um, and they speak really openly um, about the experiences, which informs what we take forward as recommendations. So let's have an offline conversation. I suppose I'm nervous around what the dynamic might be because as a councillor, they obviously clearly you're, 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 you know, you're elected, they respect you, and that might affect what they bring forward if you're in the room. I'm not saying you've been in the room is a bad idea. I'm just thinking, you know, I, I know my people and, and, and they know how powerful you are. They might think differently. So let, let's have a conversation about how we can meaningfully engage with you on that. I know you've got a real interest on the recruitment piece because you mentioned that to me before. So I think there are ways we can make sure we get your voice into the conversation. Let's, maybe let's have a chat about how best we do that. Um, on the um, your point about EDI responsibility being everybody's responsibility, we say that in the training all the time. And in fact, it's a third slide, if I remember, in the training pack, that you know, this is not John Ebel, Science Civic, you know, getting your EDI off. That's not how this works. Um, it has to be done every day in your, in your own role. Our 
hope is we get to a point where we we have a resource to be able to deliver that across the organization but in the first instance that stage four bit of the training session that i mentioned is a manager's responsibility so you've come across to us as a manager you've been trained you've been given the resources you put together a simple plan for your team and you deliver then that that kind of adi responsibility to your team so everybody buys into the same training the same thing you had so that's available already. Clearly, we have 14,000 staff. So we need to think about how practical it would be to deliver this across 14,000 staff in a two and a half hour face to face session. It is not probably practical to do that to everybody. So we are using the managers as a conduit. I think the managers know clearly they have a role to play. So they've had the training, they've had the support network, they had, they're responsible, as you say, and then to take that up with their, with their staff and make sure they cascade that training would be my answer to that. On your point about um, benchmarks, I'm looking at Andy. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so benchmark, Councillor Bill, with the benchmarks as regards to the grievance element, grievance practice review more generally? We can benchmark in various ways. I mean, the most obvious one, wouldn't it, would be grievance and an element of disciplinary, because quite often in disciplinaries, then it will bring out things around protected characteristics, which will influence um, things that go to tribunal. But whatever you've decided to use as that benchmark, you then use as, uh, for future evaluation, don't you? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, so you're absolutely right in terms of that. So what we do do with those um, different employment practices, whether that's discipline or grievance, we do look at the protective characteristic split. So we, we have um, that granular level of detail. One of the key things that John's tried to focus on in terms of the particular grievance practice review um, and a key metric for us is the time taken to remedy a grievance. Um, but also really what the outcome of that grievance is. So we have taken the view that um, it is always better to resolve a grievance, particularly regarding a discrimination issue um, quickly and informally. And one of the reasons why we wanted to do all of that work um, led by John and, and all of the engagement that we've done is that we were finding that we were taking people through quite a long process. So the longer you take people through the process, the more frustrating and challenging it can be. So the time taken and what the remedy and outcome is, is, is a key measure of success for us. Um, and John, I think you did some quite good analysis in terms of actually looking at that time taken and what the, the outcome and that and what the progression of those um, formal issues were. Just so it comes but just to add to that, now that I properly understand the question, um, in, in the report is an analysis of our grievances based on protected characteristics. So it sets out by grade in numbers for the last year or so. So we've got that benchmark there to say, if you pick a particular service in a grade, what's the grievance data telling us? What's coming for it? So I would hope, obviously, we, we, we seek to reduce that. But I would I would urge a warning, and the warning is we're doing lots of EDI work, and lots of services and colleagues are now awaking to this challenge. So it may be we get more reports actually coming forward. So that's not necessarily a failure. It just means actually people feeling comfortable talking about these issues. Thank you. I think what I were actually asking is, and I have read and I've seen you you break down. Before the piece of work started, where were it benchmarked? Um, and and I can't see it anywhere. So we can look at the, the data you've supplied now and the downward or upward trend, which would actually be success as well. Can I just kind of comment on something you said about the importance of dealing with all grievances quickly? Um, I would actually disagree with that. It's important to deal with some grievances quickly. And I think what I'm saying is our grievances um, are the best for what is the best for that grievance. Haven't said that very well. Because some grievances, the law will determine that you need to do certain things. And it's really important that people are encouraged to take the right steps for them, not just to make the process quick. 
No, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the outcome of the grievance has to, has to remedy what the individual's concern or complaint or worry is. Um, and as you rightly say, there will be a whole variety of what they are. So some of them will involve quite a lot of intervention, a lot of due diligence, a lot of formality, um, if if it warrants that. I think the challenge we were having before was that lack of triage, where perhaps all grievances were um, taken through a um, complicated process where actually it may just warrant a, uh, an informal conversation or some engagement with a third party or mediation, or whatever it might be. Um, so it's, it was judging and determining what the right outcome for that grievance is rather than treating every grievance as a very complicated formal process. But you are right, some will always still be complicated and formal. Um, I should also answer your comment just about the uh, role as well in terms of the need to prioritise uh, EDI. Uh, the good news is, is that we, we do agree with Scrutiny Board on this. It is a key priority for us. So um, you'll be delighted to know, hopefully John will be delighted to know that we have secured um, funding for that role moving forward. Um, so that is um, some positive news. Uh, we've managed to uh, uh, keep your job here, John. Well done, well done Scrutiny. Just um you just following up on councillor burt's question in terms of teams managers cascade information to teams is there any follow-up stroke accountability on that information being cascaded yeah we are we are so yeah the dashboard would be a useful pointer as to how teams are picking this up. I think that will help us to identify that. We are giving managers very simple, basic tools of how you bring this about within your teams, making it a standard agenda item in your team meetings, providing the space for, for colleagues to ask questions and all that kind of stuff. I think, yeah, we need to think about how we meaningfully measure how we're reaching that. Now, I want to go back and think about that. It's a really good question. Just, I don't, I don't want to forget Councillor Burke's last question on intersectionality. I think it's an important question. And there's about 20 minutes or so of the two and a half hour training session around that. There's a whole section on intersectionality. And we spend a bit of time explaining what bringing your whole self to work means. No human being exists in a single box, right? I'm a proud Nigerian of African heritage, British. Um, and my makeup is complex and unique to me. Um, and I'm, I'm quite clear what my intersectional points are. So we talk a lot about that um, in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the training session and expose managers to what we mean by intersectionality and guard against just looking at a particular legal protected characteristic. What we're doing here is more than that. We, we do all the legal duty stuff. That's just bread and butter. What's important is you understanding what these values mean, what it means. Do you know your team? What's the makeup of your team? right as a group where are the gaps you need to fill and all that stuff is cultural change and i keep banging on about that's our focus right our focus is making sure our organization is truly representative of our communities and we only do that by having those conversations and that part of the training is really important and we have really maybe you should come and join one of our sessions and see at the back and listen we have really interesting conversations on how we're, we're turning that around and getting underneath that particular topic as values, right? If you sign up to be elite the council staff, you sign up to our values. They're non-negotiable, right? You can't be open and honest today and not be open and honest tomorrow. You can't do it 40, 50, 60%, all right? You're either with us or you're not. So in front of um, witnesses and on YouTube, I want to say, yes, I'll take up your invitation, John. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure it was an invitation, but I'm accepting. And just lastly, just following on from what you said, um, I wouldn't disagree with anything you've said. The report talks, again, putting much of the focus on managers during the appraisal process. Well, I would argue that appraisal processes are the other way around. It's the appraisee's um, responsibility to go equipped and to take evidence that supports because an appraisal shouldn't be something that's done to you it's the other way around so perhaps that just needs flipping a little bit so it is the manager's responsibility to pick up things that come up in an appraisal but it's certainly we should be empowering people as the appraisee to take that to that meeting 
Yeah, I couldn't disagree. Fully, fully agree on that. Yeah, can I just make a couple of additional points? Just in first off, in terms of the training, I mean, obviously this mandatory training is massively stepping up, but it is probably also quite important to say there has been quite a lot of EDI training available over a long period of time, actually, and, um, you know, an increasing amount. And I know um, I had to look for something oh, about a year ago, and, and I was really surprised just how much there is. Um, and I think we've done work as well to try and improve the signposting of that. So it can be um, tailored. So I just wanted to make that, important point is not although the mandatory training is new and really a significant focus it's not the the first time we've done um edi training and just to add to what john said in terms of accountability i agree with you in terms of the appraisal process it should be for both parties definitely to bring that um and in terms of closing out those um you know making sure that everybody is doing the mandatory training and, and each of the five steps um i mean I, I wouldn't quite say it gets a mention in every single weekly update um that we do but probably not far off um and we have been really tracking through and making sure right here's your list who still haven't um and ramping up the action that we've been taking um in response to those so keep it Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Burke, for uh, for your questions this morning. Um, and I'd just like to give a further invitation out to you to come and join my team um, to uh, see the kind of work that's happening um, through my portfolio on this agenda as well, because of uh, obviously the interest that I know you have, but um, you know the interest that you've shown on this on EDI particularly um today I, I, i'd be uh, very happy for you to come and, and join my team on the work that's happening there uh, and i'm sure it'll inform you more absolutely again once on camera i'm taking that up thank you uh, thank you very much for those contributions councillor burke really helpful okay i'm going to bring in councillor flynn next thanks andrew um it might have been better john to have had the updated statistics that you showed us before uh, before the meeting today because it actually updated the uh, the five workforce priorities, uh, which I already had done a lot of work on, uh, waste of time. Um, bit of death by PowerPoint, much better to have this information in advance, okay? Um, I couldn't see the um, information on the screen anyway, uh, but what I did pick up was um, under the workforce uh, priorities, the sorry, the workforce priorities, um, under support more people to progress, um, better, care, better career development options for underrepresented groups, how work is allocated, acting up and honorariums, and under training for staff and managers, more regular reporting of uptake. In all those three cases, work has yet to be started, which I think is critical to the success of the entire project. I've got a couple more, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Councillor Flynn. Uh, and apologies for that. We can we can share more data to you separately in the report format. I, think I can certainly, certainly get that across to you to have a look at. Um, progression is probably the one where we've, we've had the least, um, I suppose, progress <laughs> um, at this point in time. And there's a recognition we need to do more on that. We're trying to come up with a, a framework of what we can kind of hang off what progression means. And that's why we spend some time looking at positive action. And what do we mean by that? Because if you're going to target underrepresented groups appropriately in the organization, we need to be clear what we're saying to organization and allowing managers to do. Um, the last thing we want to do is end up in a situation where um, the perception that we're favoring particular groups becomes an issue and a challenge for us. And that's only fair. We you know our approach is purely about merit, right? And we need to make sure that's a kind of starting point. So we're clear then when we're delivering quality, yes, we need to make sure we understand uh, we meet colleagues at, at who have a particular need. That's the whole point of equality. And we address that. But to do that, we need to be clear on, on on positive action. So our work on the progression piece is around that. That's what we're trying to do. And once we get that clear, I think the action that flows from that is probably much easier. But yes, you're right. That's the area where we need to do more work on progression. I'm not going to... Um... Um, whistleblowing, uh, Mariana, you'll be sick of me asking about this, I'm sure. Uh, every time I asked, and the last time was last Monday, 
Um, I retire battered and bruised, uh, but in good order and ready to come forward again. Um, Mariana, you said before, um, it's quite difficult to actually measure or judge how the whistleblowing um, or, the, or the, the new sort of uh, guardian is actually uh, being successful or not. Um, and that's absolutely critical to it. It doesn't matter how good or how great the guardian actually is. If it isn't working, um, you know, it, it's it's a complete not a waste of time. And the only way you know it's working is if we get feedback from the people who are actually blowing the whistle, which is difficult, I know, because a lot of people are uh, do it anonymously. Um, I've, I've mentioned before that we talk about the NHS and whistleblowing, and that's where we got the idea from. Uh, the NHS is is one of the worst examples, actually, of what happens to whistleblowers when they speak up. You put your head above the parapet there, by and large, it gets shot off. Um, so uh, it, I, I know there's no answer to it today. Uh, what I want to know is, from a staffing point of view, is whether or not they think it is successful. Not not whether we do, whether management do, but whether the staff think it's successful, because that, that's who it's aimed at. Um, and, and lastly, I would have welcomed the views of staff groups here today, because what we've heard is the, is the management side, what we're actually doing and all the rest of it. Um, the key to this is whether staff, in, in you know, addition to whistleblowing, feel that what we're doing is right, it's progressing rightly, and it's going in the right direction. So perhaps at uh, future meetings, uh, we can ask the staff groups to to attend and give their representations of what the staff think about it. Just just on the staff group, I do think it's worth noting that we have had all um, all the staff groups here, and the reason we have this meeting is because at the last staff group time they were here we spent so much time speaking to the staff network which is absolutely what we should do uh, I cut off Councillor Gruen and didn't let her ask John any questions because of the time so I, I do I do take your point we need to keep that focus and I think that's something as a chair I'm quite proud of actually having brought the staff networks all here but I take that point on board and uh, if I'm chair again I will I will bring them back next year. Yep, Councillor I, I absolutely understand that but what is the point of what we're trying to do it's to improve the working lives of staff. So if we're not doing that from their perspective, what's the point of doing it? We need to know what their views actually are. Yes, I agree. And as I said already, we listened to them at the, uh, two meetings ago um, and we wanted some follow-up from the statements they made about the corporate response. And I, and I guess my take would be, ideally we'd have had them at the same meeting, but the, there wasn't time to listen to the John and I prioritised listening to the staff networks last time, brought John back, this time to listen to John and the corporate team. And then in the future, if I'm still chair, um, I'm sure we'll bring bring the um, the staff networks back. The other, other points, I'll let John, Mariana wants to come in, so I'll let you come in. Yeah, I mean, obviously the whistleblowing and the freedom to speak up, they have similarities, but they are also different. Um, so obviously audit colleagues answered last Monday. Um, I think I did say earlier, we will try and ensure that from Vanessa's point of view, she is checking in with those colleagues who are raising freedom to speak up concerns where we know who they are. Obviously, you know, there is that anonymous category and then there's a confidential category, then there's a more open category, but she will be checking in with those to say, have I dealt with it satisfactorily? Has anything changed? But it's a bit too early to have that information um, just yet. Councillor Cooper. Yeah, if I, if I can just add um, to the point about the uh, whistleblowing and the Freedom to Speak Up Guardian, we're a very different organisation to the NHS, Councillor Flynn. Um, and uh, I don't disagree with your, uh, your kind of um, statement on the NHS and whistleblowing from from what I've seen but I think here at least City Council we um we deal with things much differently to the NHS which is you know why we're the first uh, council in the UK to have um a freedom to speak up guardian and we're dealing with it in a very different way in fact I think not only is Vanessa getting support from um uh, freedom to speak up guardians uh in the NHS and nationally, but actually I think they're learning something 
from uh, Vanessa's role here in the local authority and and how that's different. And it is really we're in, we're on that journey. We've started that journey. We've made that commitment. We um, are going to continue with that commitment, um, but we've got to give it time, haven't we, to see how that progresses um, and uh, uh, you know over over time. Um, and, and into the next year. So, um, you know, let's let's give that chance and see um, how much that of a difference that's going to make um, as as we go as we go along. Can I just make a point about the staff networks or the staff not being here today? Um, and I've I've been to most meetings. I, I missed the last one where uh, the the staff um, actually attended, but but I do understand from what the chair said. Um, and from my briefings on um, scrutiny, that actually uh, the staff have really um, made their um, understanding of our corporate policies very clear to scrutiny, um, and very recently, in fact. So I really appreciate the time given to um, corporate colleagues, HR colleagues today, for uh, them to have the opportunity um, to explain fully the policies and the commitments that are in place uh, in order to um, to uh, prioritise uh, equality, diversity and, and inclusion at this scrutiny board. I've, 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 I've set out already the priority on the Speak Up Guardian, but we absolutely have EDI as uh, at the heart of our priorities. If you look at um, Tom Reardon and um, and what he said and how um, he he devoted uh, his um, leadership session um, this year to the Be Your Best to the EDI um, and the Equality Agenda entirely, um, you know. So it's coming from um, the very top of the organisation that that commitment is absolutely there. But we're here to learn. Um, and uh, and, ta and what we take forward in progress is from what we're learning today and throughout the year. Yeah, thanks. And just when you said very top, Councillor Lewis the lead also came to the December meeting. Um, sorry, I did say Councillor Lewis earlier. Yeah, yeah sorry. As well as, yeah. as the priority. Yeah. yeah, good. Okay, do you want to come back, Councillor Finn? I'll retreat okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hopefully, not too battered, Councillor yeah. Flynn. Um, I'm, I'm sure you'll you'll come back, Councillor. Okay, um, Councillor Ritchie. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, thank you for the report, and thank you also both to Councillor Burke and yourselves for listening around uh, the use of the term BAME. Um, it proves the value of elected members and scrutiny and, and officers listening. So, thank you to all involved with that. I just want to throw in something that we're born out of one of my fascinating conversations that I'm lucky to have with my wife. When I mentioned, she asked me what we were doing, scrutinising today, and I said EDI. And she used the phrase equity rather than equality. And then she gave me a lesson in the differences. Right. Uh, now, I don't want to patronise anybody, but a simple analogy would be equality would be to give the same box to look over a six-foot fence, whereas equity would recognise any differences in heights to see that. So I just wondered if, and some organisations do have an equity, if, if we could, should be introducing that, particularly around recruitment, um, whereby, again, universities recognise this, don't they, often, in that um, they'll take lower grades from lower performing schools than perhaps private schools. So with maybe if you'd have to introduce an extra E into the EDI, I don't know. But to be fair, you have talked around the issues. I think when the vision covers some of the issues around equity, and I think in answering Councillor Flynn, you also did touch on those. But perhaps we should look at actually embedding that word equity within our e EDI. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ritchie. Um... Yes, you're right. I, I don't think there's any great desire to extend the acronym even more. But conceptually, I, I think you're right that actually a lot of the work that we are doing is about equity, not not necessarily equality. So our, our view is equity is, is about the fairness piece. Um, and that's, um, as Mariana said, is is deep rooted in our values. Um, 
So actually, I, I would agree. I think the reason the equality bits there at the moment is because it relates back to, again, an issue that John said earlier in terms of we have to do it. The, you know, we've got the Equality Rights Act. There's a legal framework that still uses the, the equality terminology. And, and that's that's why it's there, although the outcome is actually focused on the equity. Um, so it is a little bit uh, of a mixed bag. I, I don't think yet we've got a, a remedy for that. Um, but conceptually, I do completely agree with what you said. Yeah, um, thank you, Andy. And just to add to that, if, if you were to attend one of the sessions, Councillor Reggie, you would see a, a picture that I, I use as a stock item that has three boxes that has equality, equity, and inclusion. And we, we take real time to explain what that means. So I think language is really important in this sector, in this, in this space, and letting our managers understand it's about the way of being, All right? And I made that point again. And we talk about equality. Equality is the most easiest and sometimes confused senses. Obviously, everyone thinks about treating people fairly, you know, in terms of everybody the same, right? Everybody has the same box. That's why I get that. What we're about is equity, treating people according to their needs. And we take time to kind of explain that central point to all our managers. But yeah, that slide, I, I wish I had that slide up um, that we used to explain the very point you're making. So thank you for that. That's uh, really reassuring to you. And um, again, thank you to my wife for educating me this morning, as she often does. Um, so one one area that perhaps I'll just drill down to is around recruitment. So taking the university example, um, so our marginalised communities particularly would perhaps benefit. Um, and I know you probably don't want to open up the whole recruitment debate. That's another item. But just to touch briefly on that, if there are any plans to to look at that and you know entry levels and so on. So we're doing some of that already. We, we, I mean, actually, my, my colleague that was here before, Claire, um, who heads up our recruitment piece, could have talked about this. But we are looking at that already, how we use apprenticeships appropriately. Do we take out the service to our communities? Um, so we're looking at that. We, we're revamping our website at the minute in terms of how we recruit. Uh, you'll have seen a video that we launched on YouTube with Tom talking about our values and reaching out to our communities. So there is work ongoing, and we can probably bring something back at a, another date to you on that. Yeah, a really good example of that, Councillor Rich, is the collaborative work we've done with the NHS locally, where we have done a piece of neighbourhood recruitment of going into um, priority neighbourhoods um, and really engage with the local community and encourage them to, members of the community, to consider working within the NHS or ourselves, where previously perhaps those ro roles would not have seemed um, accessible um, and there's been some success in some of those priority neighbourhoods. Fairly early days, it started a couple of years ago, um, and it is quite intensive, uh, resource intensive, but nevertheless, it really is sort of bringing down some of those um, access barriers. So lots of um, plans to do that. We're actually working with our anchor organisations to try to broaden it beyond just the council and the NHS. Um, to engage uh, the higher education institutions, as you've rightly mentioned, the universities, they're really keen to, to get more involved in that neighbourhood recruitment. Just to give a really practical example of that as well, a lot of the recruitment we've done with business admin service where we had a lot of challenges with recruitment, um, you know, did use our jobs and skills service to get out into community hubs, support people with application forms, try different kind of application forms and different aspects of recruitment to try and really get to um you know again like john's point people who are representative of the city and who might normally face various barriers good thank you for that really really useful question there councillor Ritchie. appreciate that okay i'm going to bring in councillor chapman next very quickly a huge thank you to mrs Ritchie for uh raising equity with you this morning councillor Ritchie. and just to let you know that um the theme of uh, this year's international women's day was equity not equality so um please pass our thanks on to her um thank you i just wanted to go back to the you said we did slide um about the grievance practice review it was they said it didn't work and the we did was we had a review but it doesn't actually tell us 
the outcome of that review? So did did was there significant changes and how we're we monitoring if that is what people actually wanted to see? It goes back to the monitoring of things that we do. Uh, thank you, Councillor Chapman. Um, we, we can share the we can share the we can share the report if helpful. That sets out the findings um, of that report, the summary of that report, um, the key four areas that we rec made recommendations under, which was accountability. So making sure um, that we hold managers to account. I'm trying to remember them now. Uh, consistency of approach across the organisation. Um, and there's one around, oh, I don't remember the, the other two, but certainly we can share the report that sets out all that work um, that's in the public domain. So we can share that with you, um, if helpful. Do you want to, have you got a supplementary? No. I guess the thing is, is how we, so we've got the report and, and, and everybody's aware of it. How do you then monitor the, the changes that you've made and what the staff wanted to see? as opposed to an interpretation of what they might have wanted. Do you see what I mean? I'm, I'm probably not saying that very well, but uh, um, <laughs> basically, does it address the issues that the people had in the first place? I, I guess we'll have to ask them. I, I, my take is we're too early in, in the process. So we're, when we're on point three of uh, John's five-step plan. And so next year, hopefully the staff networks will come back to the scrutiny board and my my take was as very candid with us uh, last year and and the year before, so I'm sure they'll continue to be candid with us if we're not not getting it right. But certainly one element will be our scrutiny work at this board. Yeah, and I've got that written down here to say next year when they come back, can we ask ask them? Yeah, um, thank you, Councillor Chapman. Um, Councillor Burke. Thanks, Chair. Can I just ask, obviously it's a huge piece of work, um, 40,000 staff is huge, but are there any plans to deal with associated organisation? I'm thinking um, TMOs, um, subcontractors who would be viewed as being firmly part of the council. Um, I was at a meeting quite recently where some of the the conversation and the language was quite was appalling was overtly racist and appalling which of course I challenged but the the common view is that they are part of this local authority even though that's by association so I think that's a a really key area that we perhaps need to look at that's number one and can I just comment on the freedom to speak up guardian I think it's a fantastic initiative. It's a great role. And if she's got 80, nobody could have a caseload of 80 ongoing because she wouldn't be able to manage that caseload. So presumably that's 80 over the eight months, which makes it far more realistic and manageable. But I just wanted to say it's brilliant. I think we should be really proud we've got one. However, it's additionality, isn't it? It's not the be all and end all because we still have trade union reps in place. So we'll deal with the bulk of it. This is just another door that people can go to mm -hmm. if they, they see Fitch. So when we put it in terms of it, additionality rather than the only one, it just is fantastic. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, if I talk about the the, the last one, I, mean, I think we've always been clear. I think Mariana made a point that the freedom speak of guardian is your rights. Another door into the house. At least you can enter the house. Um, and we're very clear that we have obviously whistleblowing policy. We always mention obviously routes to um, trade unions, um, and we're making it easier. I think is 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 a key point, isn't it, for our colleagues to come through and speak freely about what they see because until we know that we can't respond and act properly so you're right about it's an additionality but a really important um additionality okay thank you so in terms of the first point councillor Burke, perhaps two quick things from me on that so john referred back to the um the broader citywide edi vision and action plan that exec board approved february and that does talk about a wider 
um, population of people and organizations. So obviously it talks about us as an employer, um, as an organization, but it also talks broader in terms of EDI being built into service delivery, which will, as you rightly say, include other organizations that we commission with um, that deliver services on our behalf. So there is that expectation that those values and those um, some of the issues that John shared will be built into those other organizations. Delivering that's obviously work in progress. Um, what we have done is there are some checks and balances to make sure that um, that should work in practice. So when we procure and work with partner organizations, those organizations as part of that procurement criteria will have quite strict EDI obligations as part of that social value piece. So we we shouldn't and we don't work with organizations that can't demonstrate similar values that don't have some commitment in EDI. So, you know, we, we, we have those checks and balances, but obviously the experience that you shared that may not always land and we may need to keep working on it. And I'm happy to share that with you, perhaps outside this meeting. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, thank you very much for coming today. I really feel like um, it's been a useful discussion and I, and I think you can see, we're really pleased to hear it's a priority of the administration and of the council. As you can see, it's also a priority for this uh, scrutiny board and, and for myself, I think it's really important. So thank you very much for that. Um, as I, I, I always think it's best practice is if we go over 90 minutes that we should have a comfort break. So I'm going to uh, thank you very much, close this item, and then we'll come back in 10 minutes time just uh, out of, uh, I think that's the best practice. So thank you very much and see you again in 10 minutes.
Okay, welcome back, everyone. Thank you uh, for coming back. It's good. Um, next item is item nine on page 41 of the agenda pack, and this is about uh, electoral services and, in particular, voter ID. So, I'm going to pass over um, uh, to Susanna. As usual, I assume we've uh, read the papers, but if anything in particular you want to draw out, please feel free to do so. Thank you, Chair. OK, so we were asked to bring a report to Scrutiny Board um, to update on the requirement for voters in polling stations to show photographic ID from the 4th of May onwards. Um, this requirement will also apply at parliamentary elections, but not until October 2023. It doesn't apply to postal voters, of which we've currently got 178,000 in Leeds. Um, later this year, it is anticipated that postal voters will need to reapply, which will largely be an online process. And at this time, their identity will be checked with DWP by matching the national insurance number. And this is the same way that they are checked when they register to vote. Based on the current in-person electorate and various research carried out by the government and electoral commission, we expect between 2,000 and 7,000 applications for free voter ID called a voter authority certificate. At the time of writing the report, at the beginning of March, we had received just under 600 applications. This morning, the total is 951. There have been no significant increase in postal voting applications to bypass the ID requirement, which has been the case in neighbouring authorities. We think this is due to the fact we already have a very large postal voting electorate, which is a legacy of the write-out prior to the COVID elections in 2021. The electoral registration officer established a project board for voter ID in October 22, um, attended by electoral services, communications and marketing team colleagues, web team colleagues, the contact centre and IDS, and it's chaired by the chief officer of elections and regulatory. Uh, the communications and marketing team have been heavily involved in publicising the requirement to show voter ID, and the report outlines everything that had been done to raise awareness up to the start of March. So what I'm going to do now is just provide a further update on what we've done over the last few weeks. Um, localities colleagues have been provided with and have shared information via community forums and communications platforms. Work remains ongoing in this area to extend the reach as much as possible, including the LGBTQ+, trans and non-binary communities. National resources produced by the Electoral Commission have been translated into multiple languages and used as part of a focus on tailored information to those communities. Translated posters have been placed on cage refuse wagons operating in Beeson and Holbeck, Gipton and Hare Hills and Hunslet and Riverside wards, as well as the city centre. These are slow moving, highly visible vehicles following routes through communities where Urdu, Punjabi, Romanian and Polish are spoken. Social media messaging tailored to speakers of Urdu, Romanian, Punjabi, Portuguese and Polish are currently running on Facebook and Instagram, targeted again to speakers of those languages. Faith and religious organisations and groups have been contacted with posters and information either directly or via community networks. Tailored electoral commission information has also been distributed via council colleagues to people experiencing homelessness and also to Gypsy, Roma and traveller groups. Information tailored for older people has been shared with care and nursing homes across Leeds, as well as with, as well as with older people's groups via community networks. Um, we're working with the Leeds Society for Deaf and Blind People to share gu uh, guidance tailored for blind and partially sighted um, electors, as well as people that use British Sign Language and um, want easy to read uh, documents. Everyone who is currently registered to vote anonymously has also been contacted with information as they require a specific document called an anonymous electors document to be able to vote in person. As the report mentions, the service has planned well for the additional workload and there's been no impact on the usual preparation for the May elections. Um, finally, polling station staff training is currently being finalised and includes comprehensive information about dealing with the new processes. In addition to the interactive online training they usually receive, presiding officers who are in charge of the polling stations will receive face-to-face -face training from myself and the Deputy Head of Electoral Services. So in most cases, the only change to an elected experience will be to show their ID between being located on the register and issued a ballot paper. Any instances of electors being turned away because they don't bring ID, don't bring accepted ID, or their ID is believed to be a forgery will be recorded by polling station staff. In all circumstances, they will have the opportunity to return to the polling station with their accepted ID. 
And um, that concludes my summary of the report and happy to take any questions, Chair. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll start again, mm -hmm. if that's okay. So just in terms of um, the, the other item that could happen is ID doesn't look as close as you might expect. I just wanted to touch in on, I guess, one, uh, the training on that, because um, I think that's quite a difficult judgment call for someone who's not a professional border control person to make a judgment on. And so is any training. And, and I guess linked to that is around um, two other things linked to that. So one is around security of the presiding officers and, and that sort of thing. And the second is around um, uh, women who uh, um, may not feel comfortable uh, um, with a male inspecting their face really closely. So just that um, that piece, please. Okay. So um, in terms of ID looking like the elector, um, every member of polling station staff will receive training on how to um, look at distinguishing features, so look at eyes, ears, nose, positioning of those, um, and also to look past gender as well, because somebody may have an ID that is um, not... Um, typical of their, their gender at that time when they're presenting in the polling station. So they will have comprehensive training on that, both from the Association of Electoral Administrators. Um, there's things in the uh, Electoral Commission's handbook they all get, and then we will go over that again with them. Um, security of polling station staff. Most polling stations have an additional person in there, but also we have had several meetings with the police now. They are very... Um, encouraging of making sure that we keep the process safe and that they will be on hand within minutes if there is an incident that they feel that they need to attend. Um, we've also got security at various polling stations where we've identified or where they've requested that it's required. Um, in terms of women in um, female staff in polling stations, we have um, at the moment, I think 20 stations where we've not been able to put a female member of staff in out of 330. These are in areas where it's very unlikely that somebody will need to remove a face covering. We've, we've done a risk register on that and looked at the areas that we think we definitely need female staff in. In every area, there's a female polling station inspector. Um, so if there is a male member of staff in the station and they are um, asked for a female to do the identification check-in, we would call the polling station inspector they will all be within about 10 minutes of any station because we've doubled the number of polling station inspectors. So there would be a minimal wait for electors if that was needed. Uh, thank you. And then just just in terms of the, again, in terms of if uh, the ID doesn't appear close enough, would uh, I would suspect that someone might want a second opinion. Is that something that would be expected to plan for? Yes, what we'll say to uh, presiding officers is only if they're not able to make a final determination themselves should they call the polling station inspector who will come and make the final decision. And the law actually omitted um, allowing polling station inspectors to do ID checks and make a final decision. So they will all be appointed deputy returning officers with powers specifically for that to enable them to do so. Thank you. It sounds like they'll have a... A lot of additional work this year. Okay. Are there questions from any other board members on this? Yeah, Councillor Ritchie. Well, it's not a question, but a comment, and I, I think it's important to make. You've obviously this has been dropped on you by government. I don't think any of us in this room wanted it and see the, the you know any benefits to it or any necessary necessity to it. So I just want to um, you know praise the work that you've done, your team, Susanna. And also the efforts that you've gone to in terms of advertising, I'm sure we'll still find people who will say, oh, I didn't know anything about this. That's inevitable. But I think you've gone, you know, far as you can. And I just hope that we do get the costs fully refunded from government as they've pledged to do, including sort of officer time and what have you. Thank you, Councillor. We are keeping um, a, a, a very good record of all the time spent and everything um, that we've had to purchase um, for this. There is um, a list of things you're not allowed to claim back for, so we've been very careful to make sure that what we do fits in with what's claimable and we're confident it, we will get full reimbursement. Thank you, and I, I echo your sentiments there, Councillor Ritchie. Councillor Cooper, do you want to come in? Yes, thank you, Chair. And uh, and I suppose just to follow on from uh, Councillor Richie's comments, that uh, I was on ministerial um, 
uh, call last week where Leeds was recognised as a, an area of good practice for uh, for photo ID at the minute. Um, from my call, um, the people uh, who were on it, um, a lot of them were struggling a lot more than um, the situation in, in Leeds in terms of being in, a, in the best position we can be for uh for ID to be uh to be brought in our um i have some concerns uh, about how it will actually uh, work on the day i have some concerns about the safety of the staff in the polling station um should um anything uh, occur if if somebody gets turned away and they become aggressive um you know towards staff and so on like uh it, that could happen and indeed the yep ran an article front page last week um uh, just about this um this this um potential uh for uh for, for issues uh on the day itself um and I, and i suppose that uh, we've done everything we can in terms of raising awareness for the electorate and uh and and indeed when the polling cards go out it will say clearly at the top of the polling card that they if you you know going to the polling station you will need uh photo id I've been invited to further ministerial roundtables, but um, sometimes my ask for them to, you know, leave it this year and uh, take it, um, you know, to future years because we're not um, in a position where 100% of the electorate will have the appropriate photo ID to be able to undertake their democratic right of voting in an election this May. I'm afraid they've fallen on deaf ears so far. Okay, thank you for that comment, Councillor Cooper. Okay. Can I just come back in on that? Yes, just on you can. something that you mentioned, Councillor Cooper, about the, the safety of polling station staff. And obviously, it's something we are concerned about and take very seriously. Um, I picked up that some violence and aggression training had been carried out um, in a BCLT update and contacted the health and safety team about that. So they will be attending our face to face briefing um, to provide more on this so that the, the staff feel um, prepared and supported for polling day. Thank you, Councillor Burke. Hi. Just looking through the report, it doesn't say, it tells you what they were recorded for ballot papers being refused, but I'm just concerned if they record what I do in terms of identification. So, as you know, it'd go against GDPR if we wrote somebody's driving license and then the number. So, what will they actually record? Will they just tick a box to say ID's been presented or will they say what it is? If somebody shows ID and it's an accepted form of ID, nothing will be recorded at all. Okay, thank you very much, Susanna. Really useful and and yeah, clearly um, you've done a lot of work on this and it's it's appreciated. Okay, I'm going to uh, close this item. Thank you very much for attending. Okay, so we're going to move on to agenda item ten, which is um, the summary of this year's work i'd just like to start so um just say thanks to becky and rob who have uh, been a principal scrutiny advisor this year been really helpful and really supported uh, my role as chair um i know neil's not here but uh, neil and mariana have also uh, fed into the work that's gone on so massive appreciation about that and then obviously also councillor cooper it listens to these meetings and takes things on board and it's good to see that we've got a similar agenda certainly today we've uh, been on the same same page with the executive so that's that's very good okay so i'll open up to any questions about the report i, I think it's mostly self-explanatory um councillor ritchie yeah just an observation um around attendance um obviously the the boards are set up politically proportionately and so on and so forth but without naming names there's you know persistent absentee um you know should that be reflecting in the report i know it goes on attendance records and what have you but i just find it bizarre really that you can have a persistent absentee when perhaps yeah. another member could take the place if uh for what for, for what it's worth, Councillor Ritchie, I agree with you. I um I looked in, I considered whether we should. The, there is one particular individual who's on 
on this report, I consider whether we could remove that person's photograph from the board because they haven't attended at all this year. Um, I, I think it's difficult because they have been appointed by the council to attend the board. And so they're technically a board member, democratically elected by their community and then uh, democratically elected to this board by the by the council. I think there's a there's a question about that attendance and um, whether that should be made more public or how that should be dealt with is, I, th I think, is a wider question. I think it, I also happen to sit on the um, Standards and Conducts Committee, and I think the outcome of that committee would be that's a ballot box issue. Um, and so I, th I think it's very difficult for us to uh, not include people who are elected, to be honest. But I, I do take your point, and I think it's a really valid point. And, and that individual could arrange a substitute or not put themselves forward for this board. Thank you, Councillor Ritchie. Are there any other comments? Yep, Councillor Chapman. I will uh, I will apologise profusely um, and uh, ask Rob to fix that as soon as possible. Yeah, you've only just noticed, so that, that's good. Um, good, okay. Okay, I can't see any other comments. Um, so we'll we'll move on to item 11, which is the work programme. Now, clearly we're the last meeting on municipal year. So any work items that you want to raise, we can pass on to the successor board if you um, wish to at this point. Um, clearly we've talked about a couple of things already today, um, not least EDI, I'm sure that should be on again next year. Uh, now, uh, Councillor Carlyle. Thanks, Chair. Um, we obviously had the uh, point on the elections there and the, and the points around um, voter ID. I think it'd be very useful to have some summary and makeup of that um, following that, just to see uh, how many ballot papers there were presented in different boxes across the city. I think it'd be valuable to see um, of, of where the correct ID wasn't able to be shown and, uh, and any issues that came about. About um, because of that, uh, I'd be very interested to see whether it affected different areas proportionately, um, and, and just what came out of it. And obviously, going forward, then we we might have recommendations that we might want to put um, to either our election service or to the government following how that's worked out. As the second largest local authority, I think it'd be valuable. Yes, I agree. I think there'll be a, a also a wider question about voter turnout compared to last time would be very uh, pertinent to that conversation. But thank you. Yes, we'll definitely pass that on. Councillor Chapman. Um, just on the lease 2023, is November too late? I mean, we have a, a session on community or ward member engagement in November. We're near the end of it. So it's irrelevant. So either we need to do it earlier or we need uh, to do it uh, afterwards. Is a I think it. that's this year's agenda what we oh, did talk about one? yes if you're on page <laughs> not, uh, 66 that's right. what we did in november okay. oh, rob okay. do you want to come in sorry we've done a brief summary of paragraph three of potential items that could go forward i did when i pulled the paper together i didn't think was any basis to put that in but it does reflect our work um other boards i know do present an outline schedule which i think is what you're referring to um but we have we have made a list of potential areas at paragraph three of the of the cover report. In that case, I think we should be looking at it earlier. <laughs> we should be looking at it in the next, you know, in the success board as yeah. soon as we can. Really. I'll, I'll take a note of that, Councillor Chairman. Yeah, that's fine. Yes, I I agree with you. I think there's a real need. I'm sure you're not the only person here who thinks we need to keep that accountability to Leeds 2023 to make sure they're delivering. Um, but I'm sure we'll pass it on to the successor board. Uh, Councillor Burke. Can I make a suggestion, Chair, please? If we look at the work schedule for this year, there's some items that naturally jump out though, to be revisited. So the annual corporate risk management report, it's annual, so obviously that should always, and the performance updates, the financial reports, they, they're kind of naturally occurring, aren't they? And perhaps we could keep a space empty almost for anything that develops and appears throughout the year that we need to look at. Yes, absolutely agree with you, Councillor Birkin. Um, 
to be fair, we've tried to do that this year. So, for example, we had the LGA peer review, which wasn't a scheduled item. Um, and then we, uh, we've we had EDI more times than I think I expected at the start. But it's because everyone's been really interested and really uh, constructive on that. And I think that's been really important. And um, that's why we had John again today, which I think was the right thing to do. Oh, yeah, everyone's nodding for people who can't see the room online. Good. Okay. Are there any more comments? Yeah, Councillor Gruen. The 2023 item, um, and you mentioned you, there's a certain time scale in which we would have to revisit that, but we might want to evaluate afterwards the impact of it after it's finished. As, as well as, yes, I agree with you. Good. Councillor Cooper. Thank you, Chair. I just want to uh, take the opportunity to thank um, yourself for chairing um, this board and, uh, and bringing the agenda items that you have to scrutiny uh, over the year. Um, and I also want to take the opportunity to thank scrutiny board members for all the work that they've undertaken um, this year. And, and, and just to say, actually, that I um, really support the work of scrutiny. I'm a former scrutiny chair myself. Um, and actually the uh, discussions that you have here and uh, and the views that you bring forward and the work that you're doing does make a difference. It influences, it influences policy and it influences decision making um, and scrutiny is always best um, when it works like that and not after the fact, um, you know, uh, looking at things that are already done and dusted, so to speak, although that has its place and I understand why. But for me, scrutiny makes its best contribution when it's able to um, influence uh, policy and decision making. And please take it from me that this board has certainly done that this year. So thank you. Oh, thank you. So with that uh, little pat on the back, thank you, Councillor Cooper. I'll close today's meeting and thank everyone. Um, 